The last person in the world I would involve in a conspiracy would be Lee Harvey Oswald. Hmm. He wasn't a leader, he wasn't a follower. Uh, he would have to do it on his own. So I, I never doubted the fact that A, he did it, uh, B, he did it all by himself. That was our guest, Paul Gregory, the author of The Oswalds, an untold account of Marina and Lee, a chilling portrait of the assassin of President John F. Kennedy and his Russian wife, Marina. I'm Mark Lawrence, director of the LBJ Library. And I'm Mark Updegrove, president and CEO of the LBJ Foundation. And this is With the Bark Off. Paul Gregory is an expert on Russia and is currently a research fellow at Stanford's Hoover Institute. A pioneer in the study of Soviet and Russian economics, his textbook on the Russian economy was used to teach more than two generations of students. But Gregory's latest book is on a subject that he has been reluctant to address for nearly six decades. His relationship as a young man growing up in Fort Worth, Texas, with Lee Harvey Oswald and his young wife Marina, one of the few who actually knew them. In fact, the brother of Lee Harvey Oswald, Robert, labeled Gregory as his brother's only friend. Gregory's inside account of the marriage of the Oswalds offers a disturbing portrait of Lee, whom Gregory believes acted alone in the assassination of President Kennedy. We talked to Gregory about the Lee Harvey Oswald he came to know, someone who possessed the motive, cunning, and killer instinct of a murderer who was desperately vying for a place in history. Paul Gregory, welcome to With the Bark Off, and congratulations on the publication of The Oswalds, an untold account of Marina and Lee. Oh, thank you. Paul, you have a remarkable story to tell, having been one of the only people to have actually known Lee Oswald and his young wife, Marina. Before we delve into that story, what made you decide to write this book now, nearly 60 years after the assassination of John F. Kennedy? Uh, there was a family reason for this. My parents, um, my father and mother, were quite embarrassed to let people know that they had associated with this Marine deserter, uh, professed communist, etc. So it was a it was a black spot. It was felt on our family on our family. Uh, I did write uh, a piece for the 60th, which was quite incomplete. And one factor that has come into play recently is the fact that there is so much material out there, particularly in the Warren Commission report, that no one has ever looked at. In addition to that, something new or relatively new is Oswald's KGB file, which I'm convinced is, is uh, legitimate. So it was this um, black spot on the family. It was the availability of, of more material. And that extra material did give me an opportunity to go into considerable depth. Uh, so I think now's the opportunity. My historian friends at um, Hoover Institution kept bugging me to do it, and I finally did it. Paul, by many accounts... Lee Harvey Oswald was a, a loner, in many ways antisocial. How did you come to know him and Marina? When Lee and Marina returned in early uh, June of 1962, Lee had delusions of grandeur, and that grandeur was going to be his historic diary uh, plus uh, his writings on uh, socialism, communism, etc. He felt that he had a story to tell. Uh, publishers would want to publish his story, and he needed someone to vouch for his um, Russian language ability. My father, who uh, was born in Siberia, uh, taught uh, Russian as a volunteer at the Fort Worth Public Library. Lee got hold of this information, perhaps Texas Employment Commission, sent him in to my father's office, who had no idea who this person was. 
and uh, prepared for him a to whom it may concern, uh, which stated that he is he was proficient in in English, and one thing led to another, uh, such as an invitation to Robert, his brother's house, which we took up and. First time I met Lee was shortly after that um, meeting in my father's office. Uh, so that would have been uh, mid June, let's say, of 1962. What were your initial impressions of the Oswalds, Paul? Uh, Lee never said very much. It was an awkward meeting. Myself, my father, Lee, and Marina. Marina spoke, I think, not a word of English. Uh, so we had very little to talk about. I would say the first impression is he di didn't make much of a of an, of an impression. Um, he he seemed like sort of a wiry, po powerful person. Uh, it was hard to form an opinion of him, but of course this was our first meeting. Uh, Marina really stood out. She's quite a beauty. Uh, sort of a, a drowning kitten uh, appearance where you would like to help her. So that first meeting was entirely social, no discussion of why he deserted, uh, why he was a communist. It was more sitting around the living room and uh, looking at the picture books they'd brought with them. Paul, how old were you at that time? 21. Maureen and I are virtually the same age. And how did your impressions of Lee Oswald change over time? Well, I would say they've changed as much in recent years as when I was actually spending a lot of time with them. You kind of got to understand Lee a little better uh, in retrospect, things that I did not really uh, place much weight on uh, later uh, became clear to me. Uh, one of the most clear things was the fact that he did not want Marina to meet anyone other than himself and perhaps his brother. Uh, he built a, a, a cocoon around her, uh, which would have been a more, which w was more effective if she didn't speak any English. So it was very clear that he did not want her to learn English and. I was too young to pick that up because I kept saying, Marina, I'll give you flashcards. Uh, you know, uh, why don't uh, you and I spend some time speaking English? And I, I could not read people well, but clearly uh, Lee was quite upset when I would bring this up. And Marina knew that she should not give it a try because she knew she would suffer if she went against Lee. The other thing about Lee was he had a way of, of supposedly answering a question without answering it. So uh, one example would be, uh, I took him out to Arlington Heights High, High School, which was our, we, we both went to Arlington Heights High School, Lee for a very short while. And the whole time I figured Lee was a graduate because he kept talking about school, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, and when I would ask him, well, what, what year did you graduate? He would somehow manage to not answer the question to avoid it. So he really, really wanted to be um, sort of a cipher. Uh, and I noticed this in all kinds of settings. You, you state in the book that you've been asked many times over the years, whether you could see Oswald's behavior leading to the assassination of John F. Kennedy. And you write, these questions remain relevant today. My answer then and now, with the exception of violence toward Marina, is I detected none of the trademarks of a future assassin. Yes, he was an avowed Marxist, but with no hint of an advocate of political assassination. Yet remarkably, Lee's actions on November 22, 1963, did not surprise me. Rather, it was as if the pieces of a puzzle were falling into place as I saw him brought handcuffed and bruised into the Dallas police station. So how did the puzzle pieces start coming together for you? Well, they 
really only came together that afternoon where they brought Lee in uh, handcuffed and bruised. Uh, the two and two I put together uh, at that time was, well, it makes sense. Here's someone who believes he's, he's bound for greatness. Uh, here's someone who thinks they have been shortchanged in life. Much of which, much of that argument was uh, drummed into him by his mother, who was uh, quite uh, a disaster. Uh, so I knew he wanted to be famous. I, I knew that uh, Marina, rather than being supportive of these, what she would call crazy ideas, uh, looked upon him with scorn. So there was the factor of getting in the history books, which I knew he wanted and somehow expected unrealistically. So it was a matter of getting in the history books and it was a matter of, of convincing Marina she should not scorn him, she should admire him. Hmm. Uh, I think this fell into place when I saw him. I mean, if you go back to the summer of 62, uh, if someone had, had said, well, this is a potential assassin, I would have thought they were totally crazy. But I never, I never really doubted the fact that he did it, and I was very convinced he did it alone. Could you see, maybe with the benefit of hindsight, any hints of violent tendencies in Lee Oswald? Well, he, he beat up his wife, and I guess I should be ashamed for not saying anything or doing anything, but uh, I was over, over their duplex regularly, and uh, there were uh, one incident for sure where uh, I came in and she had obviously been beaten in the face. The other incident uh, was described in the book where she, by mistake, stepped backwards off their front porch and hit the ground with her back carrying June, the daughter, where he went into a rage uh, about that, and uh, I was worried she perhaps had a concussion, and he was yelling at her the whole time. So I, I knew there was that kind of thing going on, but how that could lead to an assassination of a president or or of a general Walker, mm -hmm. uh, that would have would have not um, I, I would not have believed it at the time. We'll talk more about the assassination in a moment, but. But talk about how uh, Lee and Marina Oswald came together. How, how did they come to get married? Uh, Lee deserted. Well, he didn't desert. He, I think he already had the dishonorable discharge. And somehow he scraped the money together. And one thing uh, people should recognize about him was he was quite ingenious with money. He was quite ingenious with persuading things to do they really didn't want to do. He was a master manipulator. He's been underestimated, grossly underestimated, because a lot of this was dyslexia. Hmm. And so on IQ tests, he, he performed, um, you know, reasonably, reasonably well. Uh, it was his, and he was constantly moving. Uh, so R Russia or the Soviet Union was the next step in a series of, of moves. Uh, and he came there, first of all, thinking that he would be offered a good career in the Soviet Union where he could use his Marine Corps skills, etc. He also uh, had decided he would like to get married. And as someone who had his own apartment and was paid like double or triple the normal salary of metal workers, in the Minsk radio factory, uh, he was a pretty decent catch. And one thing I did notice about him is that even though he was did blue-collar work, tough blue-collar work, whenever I saw him, he was well-dressed. He was clean, he was well-dressed, and this was noted in uh, Minsk. You know, the girls were happy to go out with him. He had one love affair where he proposed marriage and was turned down, and he kind of caught Marine on the rebound, but one of his goals in going to Russia was indeed to get married. Did you get a sense from him of what his marriage to Marina was like in those early days before they came to the United States? Well, the big issue was, the f again, he 
let, let's put it this way. Uh, one of his major tasks was to find a wife. And once he saw that he was not going to make the big time in the Soviet Union, as he thought, uh, his problem then became trying to persuade his wife to accompany him to the, to the United States. This was after he decided to go back. And it was a tough sell, uh, but Marina did have sort of an adventurous streak about her, and she, particularly after she became pregnant and they had the child, then she had little choice, she felt. Uh, I knew them, of course, after the return. They were in their early months of, of marriage at the time. Uh, I never saw any, any endearment expressions of endearment or love or, or hugging or anything like that. The one thing that seemed to unite them was the, their love for June. So one could not complain that Lee was a, a bad father or a negligent father. He did his best and they loved June, but I could not see much of a spark between them. Although uh, I would say given her behavior immediately before and after the assassination. Uh, I think this was indeed a, a, a very strange love affair because she had all kinds of occasions once they moved away from Fort Worth to Dallas to break with him, but she, she, she did not break with him. Even after he confessed, that, she had, that he had tried to assassinate General Walker. Did he ever share with you anything about how he spent his time in the Soviet Union, including the possibility that he was of value to the Soviet government because of the intelligence information he had? There's no evidence that he was of any value. In fact, he was regarded as an, as an extreme pest. And his case, which I learned later, I went all the way up to the Politburo. And there the, the issue at the Politburo was the fact that uh, he had, again, through manipulation as a master manipulator, uh, he did pretend to commit suicide. And the Politburo decided we can't have an ex-Marine, American ex-Marine, dying through suicide in Moscow. So uh, they, they definitely wanted to get rid of him and these documents, which one can read now, are, I think, unquestionably uh, accurate documents. Among other things, Lee and Marina Oswald didn't see eye to eye politically. Uh, Marina saw Lee's uh, deeply held views on Cuba, for instance, as crackpot. How did both of them see the world and how did it affect their marriage? Well, I, I think you've already given a partial answer. Her attitude towards him was scorn. You know, this, why don't you why don't you enter the real world? I think was her her attitude, and she was saying all these books you're reading, where you admire the 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 person whose biography you're reading. This you, you know you're wasting your time. On the other hand, and he, with me, he did not talk a lot of Marxism, Leninism. We were more, you know, chit chat type type talking. Um, so I don't know really know how how to answer that, but uh, she definitely had zero interest in what he was interested in. Uh, his plan, and as I say, he would keep moving from place to place. So I think. The time Lee and Marina spent with me, which was quite regular, I think that was the longest period they stayed in one place hmm. because it was hmm. Fort Worth, Dallas, then Dallas, then New Orleans, then here, then here, then there. So he always thought that if he would move, you know, things would get better. Uh, she understood this was not the case. So much of his moving he did on his own, and she would, she would uh, stay with uh, friends hmm. who were Russian speaking. So it's very simple. She scorned. He, uh, he's going to do something that will be monumental and go in the history books, and that's not a very good combination. Hmm. Paul, you write that you learned of the Kennedy assassination 
while you were a student at the University of Oklahoma. Like so many Americans, I suppose you were watching television as CBS anchor Walter Cronkite announced that President Kennedy had died. You write that you, quote, had no inkling, unquote, that Oswald was involved in the killing. But when did you find out what the truth was? And, and within, what, 10 seconds, within 10 seconds of him being led into the police station. What was your reaction? I said, and I said, I know that guy. Hmm. No one paid attention. They thought I, I must be crazy or something. But it is remarkable that there was never any any small article or anything written about me as someone who knew Oswald. And I, in retrospect, I, I find that remarkable because that was really a big story. But I was left pretty much alone other than the fact that uh, I was picked up the next morning as a known associate of Lee Harvey Oswald. And that was my first uh, testimony. So they, they did catch up with me very quickly. Paul, did you see in the Lee Harvey Oswald that you knew uh, prior to him uh, 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 making the, uh, assassinating the president, did you see the qualities of a sociopath in him in your interactions? No, largely because he said very little. Um, and we, we spoke in Russian, uh, his Russian, in fact, there was a great deal of interest in intelligence and other circles about his Russian, because that might've been, if the Russian was too good, it was felt, well, this came from some, uh, KGB training camp or, you know, then there were stories about there being a second Oswald and so forth. So we spoke in Russian, uh, and uh, that, there I could say his Russian was exactly what you would expect for someone who had spent three years without language training in, in Minsk, a USSR. Hmm. Paul, you mentioned a, a moment ago that you were questioned in the aftermath of the assassination. Can you talk a little bit about that experience? What kinds of questions were you asked? Uh, anything surprise you or stand out as especially memorable and what had to be a Shocking experience. Yeah, they were, first of all, they wanted to make sure that I didn't do it mm -hmm. as a known associate of, of Oswald. There, there weren't too many known associates because he, he, he really isolated himself. Uh, then they were interested in knowing whether I could recognize certain names. And then they asked me, you know, what do you think? Did he do it? Did he do it alone? In fact, I volunteered that in the car driving up to Oklahoma City, I said, the last person in the world I would involve in a conspiracy would be Lee Harvey Oswald. Hmm. He wasn't a leader. He wasn't a follower. Uh, he would have to do it on his own. Uh, so I, I never doubted the fact that, A, he did it. Uh, B, uh, he, he did it all by himself. And he came up with what I would call a low-tech assassination. You know, the assassination equipment was a rifle and a pistol and a, and a bus ticket. Uh, so, and the fact that he, he planned his escape on a city bus, Dallas city bus is almost comical. Mm. So this is, this, this guy would not be someone to organize something or to follow something. Uh, his most immediate goal really was He'd had enough of the U.S. It wasn't going to meet his expectations. So what's the next? What's the next step? The next step is Cuba. Mm -hmm. So I'd say the last four months of his life were spent not planning the assassination of Kennedy because there was no plan at that time for Kennedy to even visit Texas. So um, he he spent virtually all his time and money sort of building up a radical persona, namely in New Orleans, pushing, you know, f free Cuba. Uh, and then he decided that if he went to Mexico City and played off the Soviet embassy against the Cuban embassy, he could get a visa to, uh, uh, to Cuba. So his, his goal 
in the run-up to the assassination was was really to leave the United States and get to Cuba. At one time, he even was uh, planning to um, commandeer a, a, a plane to Cuba. So he, this was not on his mind. He did spend, uh, according to Marina, two two or three weeks planning the Walker hmm. assassination. So he put put a lot of time into that, but things just seem to fall into place for the Kennedy uh, assassination. So I don't, and I think he would have had like four days to plan it. And, and yet, uh, despite the fact that, that your belief, having known Lee Harvey Oswald, is uh, that he acted alone, you cite in the book that two thirds of Americans still believed that there was a greater conspiracy. They, they, they reject the lone gunman theory. Uh, you believe it otherwise, and and uh, uh, you, your assertion, as you say in the book, Paul, is that Lee Harvey Oswald had, in your words, the soul of a killer. How so? Well, we we do have proof in that he did narrowly miss the head of General Walker. Um, I don't think he had deep regrets about killing JFK although he should have because Marina thought very highly of, of JFK. She was a great admirer of, 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 of Jacqueline Kennedy. And he knew that by killing the president, uh, he would uh, definitely harm or dis- no, I would, the harm would fall on, on Jackie Kennedy and on the day of the funeral of JFK, she was late to Lee's funeral because she wanted to see that. So, uh, uh, you know, being being a natural killer, I, I'd say you just once you accept the proposition that he did it and he did it alone, he obviously must have had the soul of a killer. Uh, so, and his brother uh, Robert, who is one of the really good car- good guys who comes out of this, you know, described of him doing some odd things in, in during hunting trips. He did pull a, pull a knife on his half-brother or the half-brother's wife. So I think there's a lot of evidence, but it was not something that I personally saw. But as I say, when I saw him being brought in, my first thought was, well, they know he's a communist. He's probably been interviewed by the FBI, so that explains it. But within a short while, I discarded that and and decided that uh, he, he did it and he did it, did it alone. Paul, I want to go back to something you just you you said that that uh, bears elaborating on, and and that is the fact that Lee Harvey Oswald had already attempted an assassination, the assassination of, of General Walker, which you alluded to a moment ago. Can you talk about that incident and and how that reveals the the soul of a killer, which you say that Lee Harvey Oswald had? Well, um, I, I don't, I mean, I was not an eyewitness of, of this, but I, uh, Marina did, did testify in great depth and very clearly uh, that Lee uh, had uh, prepared for this. Uh, he did not come home until very late, which was unusual for him that evening. He came in quite shaken. He was uh, he confessed to her what what he had done, which of course shocked her, and she made him promise not to do something like this again. In fact, that's that's another noteworthy thing. Noteworthy thing about the um, Walker attempted assassination, uh, and that is that uh, he planned it very carefully. Uh, this w- could have been just imagine because he ba- apparently barely missed Walker's head mm. that he killed Walker. There had been there would have been no JFK assassination after he mm. attempted. <clears throat> to kill Walker, he he hightailed it to New Orleans because he figured they'd eventually uh, catch him. Uh, so, you know, Marina did not notice any any regret that he had done it. So, in my opinion, uh, if if JFK had not come to town, 
Lee would have either gone to Cuba, where he would have been dissatisfied, or he would have uh, assassinated some political figure. Mm. And the remarkable thing about Lee is that who would have thought that the next target would be the president of the United States, be more likely the mayor of, mayor of, of uh, Dallas, you know, s some figure of that stature. Uh, if he were alive today, he would be a school shooter, I would say, mm -hmm. where the neighbors said, we can't believe it. He was such a nice, quiet neighbor. Mm -hmm. So he was bound to do something other than uh, unless he could have gotten to Cuba. Paul, as someone who knew Lee Harvey Oswald, you must have been of great interest to any number of investigators and journalists and authors, etc. over the years. Talk a little bit about what it is meant to be someone with the knowledge that, that you and, and very few other people possess. Um, uh, has this been a burden to you? Have you been able to provide, you think, bits of evidence that have really helped to advance understanding of the whole case? Well, the, the, I, I would say my contribution is knowing the guy, uh, knowing him, I would say, as well as anyone, uh, knowing the guy, um, sort of putting two and two together, uh, being able to dismiss uh, a, a lot of things. Uh, I, I did not... I did not encourage people to seek me out and ask me these questions. In fact, I, I tried to avoid this, largely because I also felt, you know, why in the world were you involved with this crazy guy? It was really not, I should have known better. And then, of course, my parents uh, did not want anyone to know about this. It's, and so whether I've been sought out uh, I would say no. I, I gave my testimony to the Warren Commission. I gave my testimony to the FBI, to the uh, Secret Service. So I'd done my duty in that regard, but I surely didn't encourage people to contact me uh, to ask me my opinion. Remarkably, the last time you saw Marina Oswald was on November 22, 1962, a year to the day before her husband would assassinate the 35th president. But she's still alive. And on the 50th anniversary of the assassination in 2013, you wrote her a letter to which you received no response. But I wonder, do you get a sense of what the, the former Marina Oswald's life is today? I would say she, she's fortunate because she married a second husband, uh, who, whose role in life was to protect her from the media and, and from charlatans. In the immediate aftermath of the assassination, the Secret Service took charge of Marina. They, they hid out at the Six Flags Inn between Arlington and Fort Worth with my father as the translator. So he, he got to hear all of this, including the craziness of, Lou, of Lee's mother. In fact, if you want to understand Lee, you have to you have to understand his mother. Uh, but in the immediate aftermath, where she was hiding out in the Six Flags Inn, uh, all kinds of charlatans started appearing out of the woodwork, including the manager of the Six Flags Inn, who invited her and her kids uh, to live with them in a re relatively small house in in Dallas, and. Uh, he, he then quit his job, became her business manager. And if you look at photographs of Marina, before the assassination, very frumpy, you know, Soviet-style uh, wear. And then after this guy got hold of her, she turned into a fashion model, hmm. actually. And so she, she was under the influence of some pretty bad people in the immediate aftermath. And that went on until she married the second husband, and they live on a farm uh, outside of Dallas. Paul, there were so many questions, to put it mildly, around the Kennedy assassination. I wonder, what are the big questions that loom in your mind? What are the questions that you would love to have an answer to about Lee Harvey Oswald? Uh, we, we, need to, we need to know more about Ruby. 
I would say that's that's the one area where perhaps something more can be dug out. I, I, I don't know about that. That's, a, that's of course, Jack Ruby, who Jack Ruby, would kill yeah. Lee Harvey Oswald shortly after he was taken into custody. Yeah. So to tell the truth, I don't think, I don't see any unanswered questions. To me, everything is crystal clear. I think those, the conspiracy theorists, of which there are hundreds or thousands of them, you know, are, are grasping onto one little fact here, one little fact there. And in fact, if you were to ask me you know, whether I saw discrepancies, you know, one person saying one thing, the other person saying the opposite, I saw a lot of them. But that's just the way things are when you have different people looking at, at, the, at the same uh, event. Uh, so, um, the, the, what I did really was to get what I thought together the the credible evidence, and you get very cre credible evidence from the uh, Warren Commission report, down to the down to the fact that they found everyone or virtually everyone who rode the bus with Lee to Mexico City. So can you imagine? You know, this is about seven months later, a year later finding everyone who was sitting on that bus with Lee Harvey Oswald. Mm -hmm. So it's an incredibly thorough uh, investigation. Uh, hardly anyone has, ever, has read it. So <laughs> the one thing I would suggest to historians who are interested is, you know, read the 10,000 pages or 100,000 pages in the, in the Warren Report. I think that's still, there's a lot of unexplored ground, but you're still going to, you are still going to come to the bottom line, which is he did it, and he did it alone. Uh, to give you an illustration, uh, there there is a theory floating around there that my father and I did it. Mm -hmm. And I, I think that's one reason why we kept low, because uh, very respectable people, including uh, a very prominent uh, Fort Worth attorney, you know, were, were, were accused. And so um, my father was accused of deliberately mistranslating Marina's testimony where the the evidence was how to translate uh, the Russian term for dark which is chomny which could be black or dark and that was that was the basis for uh, a whole uh, assassination theory mm. so if, if you were wise you, you stayed clear of it <laughs> and I think that's what we we did rather successfully. Why do you think Americans are so inclined to believe that there was a conspiracy at play in the assassination of John F. Kennedy? And why does it remain such a subject of fascination? Very simple. Uh, history is not changed by little, little, little guys like Lee Harvey Oswald. So it must be some higher and deeper force that's behind this all. I mean, history changed as a consequence of uh, his actions on November 22nd, 63. So how in the world can a, a dyslexic uh, high school dropout, Marine dropout, you know, everything sort of negative about him, uh, how can someone like that change history? It must have happened for a reason. There must have been a, a conspiracy. So... Uh, I would be surprised if there weren't these thousand or hundreds of uh, theories out there. And I'm, I'm hoping that when I talk about my book, I don't get drawn into this because I think it's a waste of time. Our guest is Paul Gregory and his true insider's account of Lee and Marina Oswald is called The Oswalds, The Untold Account of Marina and Lee. Paul, thank you so much for being with us today. Well, thank you. It was a pleasure. My thanks to our sponsors, the Moody Foundation and St. David's Healthcare, and as always to you for joining us. If you've enjoyed this episode, subscribe, rate, and review us on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you listen to your podcasts. I'm Mark Lawrence. See you next time.